It is 10 o'clock. This is Sky News at 10, our top story. Blood on their hands. Six months on from the Hamas attack, the Israeli government is accused of cowardice as the body of another hostage is recovered from Gaza. Elad Kadzir was 47 and a farmer. Tonight, the family of those still being held are calling for more action to secure their release. We demand the world to do anything to make this deal come true and bring them all back home. Also tonight, fresh questions for Labour's deputy leader, Angela Rayner, over old tweets where she refers to her ex-husband's house in which she's denied living as home. The next Irish Prime Minister tells Sky News that a united island is a legitimate aspiration, but it's not his focus. The hottest day of the year so far for some, but travel misery for others as Storm Kathleen forces the cancellation of dozens of flights and ferries. Plus... body is really starting to break down. Everything hurts. The British extreme sportsman about to finish running the entire length of Africa. And we will take a first look at tomorrow's front pages in our press preview from 10.30. Good evening. The family of a man taken hostage by Hamas on the 7th of October has told the Israeli government they have blood on their hands after his body was recovered from Gaza. El Ad Kedzir was found during an overnight raid last night, but it's believed that the 47-year-old farmer may have died as long ago as January. Now, tomorrow marks six months since the attack which began the war, and tonight the families of some of those still being held by Hamas have called once again on Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and the international community to bring them home. Our security and defence editor, Deborah Haynes, is our top story. Kidnapped from Israel into Gaza, the body of Elad Katzir was finally retrieved by Israeli forces. The 47-year-old had apparently been killed by his captors in January. What we know is that he was executed, murdered by his captors. Um, the circumstances beyond that I can't reveal at this stage, uh, but that's the situation. I think the return of Elad Katsir's body, it's a representation of the promise kept to the people of Israel, that we will work to bring home the hostages, every last one of them. But his sister also blamed her own government for his fate. She said in a statement... Elad was kidnapped from his home in Near Oz, alive and well, and filmed twice during captivity. He could have been saved if a deal would have happened on time. Our leadership is cowardly and devoid of political considerations, and therefore it didn't happen. I think there's a long the Prime Minister of, uh, is under mounting pressure American over the Israeli conduct alliance. of a war it's he launched against Hamas after the militant group's deadly attack on Israel six months ago. There's mounting anger internally among the families of dozens of hostages still held captive. He should have been with us today. He could have been with us today. And we demand the world to do anything to make this deal come true and bring them all back home. While inside Gaza, the scale of Palestinian death and destruction under Israeli bombardment has caused global outrage. This includes criticism from Israel's closest allies, especially after the accidental killing of a group of foreign aid workers this week. <laughs> More assistance dropped from the sky as the United Nations warns of imminent famine on the ground. It looks impressive, but this is a tiny fraction of what's needed as Israel continues to restrict the flow of food, medicine and other supplies. Those who don't die in the bombing, they die when they're going to get a package of flour or the aid. There's no life. Life has become impossible. Back in Israel, they also mourn. These were some of the victims of a rampage by Hamas militants through a music festival on the 7th of October. Friends come to remember. I don't think anything anymore. 
I don't know. She can't come back anymore. I can only accept what happened and then hope that the people who are still alive and are in captivity will return home. A simple hope, but as six months of war has shown, this conflict has no easy answers. Deborah Haynes, Sky News. Now, Ireland's next Prime Minister, Simon Harris, has told Sky News a united Ireland is a legitimate aspiration, but it will not be his priority. In his first interview as leader of Fine Gael, Mr Harris, who will be the youngest ever Taoiseach, has spoken to our senior Ireland correspondent, David Blevins, and told him he wants closer relations with the UK. Let's be honest, Brexit was a really difficult and challenging time. Uh, here in Ireland, we, I think, had to deal with five UK uh, Prime Ministers, six um, foreign secretaries, uh, six Northern Ireland secretaries, all in the space of five years. We had very clear um, national ambitions going into to that engagement in terms of protecting our national interests, protecting our role uh, in the single market, and crucially, protecting the peace process on this island and indeed the relations between these islands. That's what Leo Varadkar championed with colleagues. I fully support that. But I do want to have, I want to say this very clearly, I do want to have closer relations um, with Britain, uh, with the UK, with the UK government. You know, trade between our two countries is worth 2.5 billion euro every single week. We know each other historically, through families, through friends, through work. Um, Britain remains our nearest neighbour, even if outside uh, of the European Union. And I do think a lot of good progress has been made in the last year. Leo Varadkar was the first Fine Gael leader and Taoiseach to suggest that he would see uh, uh, Irish unity in his lifetime. You're considerably younger than Leo Varadkar. Do you share that view? It's a legitimate political aspiration uh, for people in our country to want to see a united Ireland. That's the Good Friday Agreement provides that framework where you can recognise different political aspirations and a very clear pathway for those to be achieved. That's not where my focus and priority is now and quite frankly I don't believe it's where our priority and focus should be. We have a peace process that is enduring on this island, it is in many ways one of the most successful peace processes in the world, but it's also a frosty peace. I don't believe we've had an opportunity to see the full potential of prosperity embedded right across the island of Ireland uh, through the framework of the Good Friday Agreement. And you can see David's full interview with Simon Harris on Sunday morning with Trevor Phillips. That's at 8.30 a.m. Now, the UK has had its hottest day of the year so far with temperatures of 20.9 degrees Celsius recorded in Suffolk. But for other parts of the country, Storm Kathleen brought travel misery with high winds forcing the cancellation of dozens of flights and ferries. Sky's Shingi Marike reports. This was the strength of Storm Kathleen, battering Galway and Ireland with strong winds and showers and lashing the Cornwall coast. Hundreds of miles north in Blackpool, a bleak start to the day for people braving an early stroll down the beach. While at Heathrow, a plane landing became precarious, a snapshot of travel disruption that saw flights and ferries cancelled across the country. But today was a tale of two extremes. Storm Kathleen also brought with it warm winds from the continent. The result? The highest temperature of the year recorded in Suffolk. Warm weather also enjoyed in nearby Cambridge. Our 11th seasonal storm somehow also a look ahead to sunnier summer months. And also a reminder, sometimes it feels like the British weather can never make its mind up. Shingi Marike, Sky News, Blackpool. Well, it's been a week now since a journalist with the Persian news network Iran International was stabbed outside his home in London. The Metropolitan Police say that those suspected of being involved in the attack on Puria Zarati have now left the UK. Well, Seema Sabet is a former TV presenter for the same network and has now been told by counter-terrorism police that she should go into hiding for her own safety. She spoke to Sky's Emma Birchley. Seema Sabet is living under constant threat. You can't even tell your closest relatives where you are. For more than a week, the British Iranian journalist has been in hiding, urged to leave her home by counter-terror police. Within hours of the stabbing of her friend and fellow presenter, Puria Zirati, on a suburban London street. I know who we are dealing with. 
I know that the Islamic Republic, this is exactly what they want. They want us paralyzed, disappointed, hopeless, and in a miserable kind of feeling. What I do is I make sure that I stay positive. What happened to Puria was an immense shock. But just one week after being attacked outside his flat in Wimbledon, he was back on screen at Iran International's London studio. I'm here after a slight delay of one week. Stay tuned as we discuss the events that happened to me over the past week. Seema used to be an anchor at the same channel, labelled a terrorist network by the Iranian government. It was work that brought significant risk. Last year, she says a state-backed plan for the country's revolutionary guards to assassinate her was exposed and foiled. They had information about where I live. They had information about the type of the car that I had. They had information on how far I live from the office, which route I take. Seema says a powerful message must now be sent to Tehran by the UK government. We need to send a very strong signal to them that this is not going to be tolerated. You cannot send operatives into this country to threaten our nationals. You cannot violate our sovereignty. You cannot violate our national security. In a statement, a government spokesperson said, we will continue to take strong action against Iran while they threaten people in the UK and around the world. The UK has sanctioned more than 400 Iranian individuals and entities, including the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, in its entirety. But Seema wants the IRGC to be prescribed as a terrorist organisation and will not be deterred from speaking out. I chose this path and I'm so proud of it. And I will not stop, doesn't matter whatsoever level of danger I get in, um, on, on what I do. That's not going to stop me. But there is a right that I have in this country. This is a right that I have as a UK national to be safe. Seema is hoping for a return to some form of normality soon. But she is clear she will not be silenced by a threat. Emma Birchley, Sky News. The deputy leader of the Labour Party, Angela Rayner, is facing fresh questions tonight over her tax affairs. The Mail on Sunday has published a series of historical tweets in which Ms Rayner refers to her ex-husband's property, which she has previously denied was her main residence, as home. Our political correspondent, Serena Barker Singh, reports. Ladies and gentlemen, Angela Rayner. The deputy leader of the Labour Party kicking off the launch of the local elections last week in the West Midlands. Seriously, the council house... Minimum wage, income support, tax credits, sure start, training and opportunities. They're the things that help me and so many others. But it's that council house and the tax affairs along with it that are becoming a distraction again. This time, questions raised by the Mail newspaper over whether she paid the correct amount of tax on her ex-council house when she sold it in 2015 before she was an MP. It all hinges on whether the home she sold in Stockport was her principal property, which would mean she wouldn't have to pay any tax on any gains. The newspaper claims that dozens of online postings made by the MP, like this one, show her posting about her children and cats at her husband's address, another property a mile away, including a post captioned, Just Got Home. Angela Rayner has maintained that she has done nothing wrong and that she has had expert tax advice which has confirmed her position. Once you're a married couple, you can only have one exempt residence between the two of you. So even though um, she said that she was living there and her husband was living elsewhere, um, almost that's irrelevant. They need to choose which of those properties is going to be their exempt property. The Labour Party said in a statement, Angela and her husband mutually decided to maintain their existing residencies to reflect their family circumstances and they shared childcare responsibilities. Angela has always made clear she also spent time at her husband's property when they had children and got married. She was perfectly entitled to do so. But now the affair is at risk of becoming a political headache for the party and the Labour leader too. 
She's taken lead advice. She's answered no end of questions from the media on this. Um, and she's been very clear, should the authorities want any more information, she's more than happy to provide it Are for you... them. The local elections are a month away, but it will be a general election soon, when a deeply wounded Conservative Party will want to take any advantage they can to inflict maximum damage to their competition. Serena Barker Singh, Sky News, Westminster. Now, Mexico has said it's going to sever diplomatic ties with Ecuador after its embassy in the Ecuadorian capital, Quito, was raided by police. Officers broke in to detain the former Ecuadorian vice president, Jorge Glass, who had been granted diplomatic asylum there only hours earlier. Well, tonight, Nicaragua said it too is cutting ties with Ecuador. Ashna Hurinag has this. Armed police have just raided the Mexican embassy in Ecuador. They went in to find their former vice president, Jorge Glass, and got what they came for. The head of the consulate attempts to run after them, but is held back and pinned to the ground. Glass, inside one of these cars, has long been seen as one of Ecuador's most wanted on charges of corruption and bribery. He'd been granted asylum by the Mexicans only hours before this. Convicted twice already, he'd sought refuge, claiming he was a victim of political persecution. But that was promptly ignored, and orders were given for Ecuadorian police to storm the complex. After trying to stop them from leaving, the head of the Mexican embassy is shaken by events and incensed at what he's witnessed. How is it the criminals raided the Mexican embassy at Ecuador? This is not possible. It can't be. It's madness. I think, yes, they took away former Vice President Jorge Glass. I'm very worried because he can be killed. There is no basis to do it. It's outside every norm. Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador described the action as a flagrant violation of international law. Ecuador's presidency sharply hit back, claiming they will not allow a criminal to stay free. A rift between the two countries had been growing since Glass began residing at the embassy in December. This breach has only deepened it. Ashna Harinag, Sky News. Now, police say that human remains found at a nature reserve in Salford belong to a man who died only a few days ago. Police have been searching for other body parts after the torso of the man was found wrapped in plastic on Thursday in Kersal Dale. Detectives say DNA tests are underway to try and establish the man's identity. Torrential rain has caused severe flooding in parts of New South Wales in Australia. Authorities say 152 people have been rescued. Nearly half of those were in Sydney's low-lying suburbs where a month's worth of rain fell in just 24 hours. And Europe's biggest active volcano, Mount Etna, in Sicily, has been blowing smoke rings into the sky. And it's quite rare, but it is generated by the combination of rapid release of gas and the shape of the new crater that opened there on Tuesday. Now, a British man is close to becoming the first person to run the entire length of Africa. Ross Cook's journey from South Africa up to Tunisia has taken nearly a year and has been anything but straightforward. But after 19 million steps, the finish line is in sight from Tunisia. Our sports correspondent Rob Harris reports. If running a marathon seems gruelling enough, put yourself in Ross Cook's shoes. Very worn shoes that have been running the length of Africa. The first person to do so, and in just one year. And this is where the epic odyssey ends, in Tunisia, at Africa's northern tip, completing a run that began at the continent's most southerly point. It's been a test of endurance and enterprise. Russ Cook has navigated conflict, criminals and the climate. It's taken the equivalent of 390 marathons for the 27-year-old to reach his 16th and final country. A trek that began in April near Cape Town has taken him on a trail around the west coast of Africa, crossing Namibia alone through the desert for a day. There is absolutely nothing here. In Angola, phones and passports were stolen. Then I saw the gun. And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, 
All contact was lost in August in the Democratic Republic of the Congo when he was kidnapped. But a growing profile helped summon public and political support for permits, eventually granted by Algeria to enter, all taking four months longer than hoped. Sickness, sandstorms and snow challenged even this self-styled hardest geezer. Oh, it's much better than yesterday. It's still a bit calm down there, but... Cook felt he'd hit rock bottom before taking up marathon running, and he's taken it to the extreme, rediscovering himself while discovering Africa. A whole village came out to see us, and it reminded me that even if I didn't make it to Tunisia, there was still more to life. But he has made it to Tunisia, raising more than half a million pounds for charity on the way. Now this 10,000-mile adventure of a lifetime is ready for an epic finale. Rob Harris, Sky News at Ras Angela in northern Tunisia. OK, let's get the latest uh, sports news now. Here's James. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with Vitality. I never really thought it was anything other than not the norm until I got to like 24, 25. I was spending so much of my day just worrying about a certain way I was doing everything I was doing. It would take up so much of your day, add extra stress and extra worry to your life. When were you first diagnosed with OCD? What, what kind of led to the diagnosis? Throughout my whole childhood I would, I would have to do certain things to, to feel, feel okay or to feel safe or for my my friends and family and loved ones to, for me to have like um, peace of mind that nothing bad was going to happen or anything like that. There'd always be so many different things that I'd have to do to like, sort of like a checklist. Never really spoke about it with anyone else, but I just thought I just thought that was something you do. It wasn't until I mentioned it to a couple of people when I when I was playing next to Chiefs and they said, yeah, that's a bit, that's a bit weird. Like you shouldn't be doing that. What kind of things were you doing or thinking? So there's a light switch on the wall there. I'd have to click it the right way. I don't know how you describe the right way, but to me there was a right and a wrong way to click a light switch on and off. And if I didn't do it right, I had to do it a certain amount of times. If, and if I didn't do it right on the final one, I had to do it more more times. Getting changed, I had to tap my toes on the floor before I put my socks on. Left foot first, right foot second, always. I had a certain order of getting changed. I had a bedtime routine, it took me about an hour to get to bed. But it was all because I would think that if I didn't do it, Either something bad would happen to myself, my family, my friends, anything like they'd get, they'd hurt themselves or they'd die or get ill or something. And it progressed and progressed over the years and got worse and worse. And I'd have to keep doing more things and more things. Now I look back on it, having had some help and spoken about it, that it is ridiculous because the way you turn a light switch off isn't going to mean your parents die. For some reason, my mind was making me think that that was that had, was going to have an effect. How did this manifest itself within your rugby? It was so ingrained in my life that it just naturally progressed into my rugby. Um, it was in all sport I played. I had to do things certain ways. The main part of where I feel it is getting dressed and getting changed ready for a game. A big one was boots, shoelaces. I had a very specific way I'd tie my laces. A certain amount of times I had to tie the loops and and pull the pull the string uh, the, the shoelace how tight I pulled it and all things like that. The first time I ever tried to change tie my boots and just tie them normally as you'd probably tie yours. I, I tied the left one right well I and I tied the right one. I, I messed up on what I would normally have done but I, I was like, it'll be fine, don't worry about it. Tied my lace. In that game I broke my leg and that didn't help obviously because <laughs> I'd done it in the week in training to see if it would be fine and I was fine during the week. And I was like, right, it'll be fine in the game. Broke my leg. That was one of the worst injuries I've, I've, I've ever had. Yeah, it wasn't ideal. It, it definitely knocked the confidence with it for a while and threw me back a few steps. Do you believe that you broke your leg because you didn't tie your shoelace properly? During that time, it definitely I was definitely thinking about it all the time. I was like, why did it happen? Was it because of this? I didn't tie my shoelaces right. I actually burnt the boots that I got. I broke my leg in as well. So like, if I have to wear, ever wear those again, I might break my leg again. Now I look back on it and think, yeah, absolutely not. No way did it affect it. What work have you done to kind of try and deal with it. We have a psychologist who, who comes down to Exeter Chiefs and sees a few of the guys. We basically sat, sat down about it. He didn't know I had OCD, I don't think, until I mentioned it. He basically said to me, plain and simple one day, 
do you think the way you turn the light switch off is going to affect your, your family or if so, make something bad happen or someone die in your family? And I was like, well, if you say it like that, no. And he said, well, I understand that it's going to be very tough for you to do things straight away in games and in matches because that's going to affect you mentally a lot and you don't need to have things like that distracting you from what you have to do on a match day. So I tried it in, in training for a few days, um, only little things at a time. Like the first day I, I maybe didn't, I deliberately didn't turn the light switch off right before I left the house. I was anxious for the first little while, then it was fine. And I think in sport, you, you never improve massively overnight. You always have to do baby steps and working on things takes a lot longer than losing things. And it's very much the same in, with my OCD and controlling that. Like I felt myself in the summer before the the World Cup camp, um, feeling a bit more agitated. I did feel a few things coming back in, like the amount of times I have to tap things before I put my... This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Right, thank you for that, James. Now, gang violence is escalating in the Thai city of Lopburi between rival groups of monkeys. Now, in the ancient city, macaques are a symbol of local culture and draw lots of tourists, but... The population balloons during the pandemic and they are becoming more and more aggressive. Our Asia correspondent Cordelia Lynch sent us this. They're lurking on every corner, scaling wires, clinging onto shops and people. These are the monkeys of Lot Buri. They're smart, nimble, brazen and hungry. Gangs of rival macaques have taken over the city, with some attacking people. For some businesses, they are a menace. Some customers are scared to come here because they are worried about getting bitten by the monkeys. The power balance here is a little off. Rangers locked and loaded with a tranquilizer, hoping to remove a few unruly characters. I've just been told that the monkey this man is trying to get is known as Krupala, which means gym teacher. So called because he keeps stealing students' belongings, but he's proving pretty tricky to catch. He was fittingly agile, but another on the most wanted list slipped into view. The shot is only the start. The monkey pulls out the tranquilizer, chewing it like a toy. They're still, for now, his playground. They will all be taken to a temporary shelter, sterilised before being released to other more suitable areas. Are there not more humane ways to deal with these monkeys? We sterilise them to decrease their population and then relocate them. There are many ways we treat them humanely. The earlier dart has finally kicked in, now heavily sedated. His friends watch anxiously as he lies unconscious. The monkeys have long been a symbol of local culture, drawing in tourists who feed them and some say the problem. But soon the Royal Thai Army will also join the effort to try and take control. Cordelia Lynch, Sky News, Lotburi, Thailand. Well, that was Sky News at 10. Uh, coming up, we'll take a first look at tomorrow's papers in our press preview. Tonight, we're joined by the executive director of the Youth Endowment Fund, John Yates, and by the editor-in-chief of the nationalworld.com, Nancy Fielder. Well, among the stories we'll be discussing, this on the front of The Observer, their headline, Cameron warns of Gaza famine as the Navy sent in to aid the starving. We'll be right back. So a tape of material recorded around the early 80s when he moved to Ostend has been uncovered. Uh, it's owned by a family from Belgium who were, I think, connected to the uh, 
the concert promoter who invited him to go and live in Belgium when he was trying to clean up his act in 81. And okay. they're saying there's new material that's not been heard by Marvin Gaye before. And obviously, as you know, a soul pioneer, one of the most important musicians ever, it's quite exciting that there is new music, but what kind of music, we don't know. I mean, it is ama it's an amazing story. He was in London in the 80s. He was taking a lot of drugs and uh, a concert promoter felt, was saying, look, you need to sort, sort yourself out. Why don't you come to our stand? And he did, and there are stories of him jogging around our stand, sweating it all out, getting clean, and he started working on new material. And, and his album, uh, Midnight Love, large parts of that were written in, in Ostend before he went back to LA to record it. So, I mean, it's almost like going back to the, like, the Taylor Swift thing, like, who owns the masters, who owns the, the actual songs. And so it's kind of, yeah, the, the estate will own the songs and the publishing, presumably, whereas the, the, the family will own the... They own the master tapes, they own the kind of physical recording of those songs. And so the question is, will they come together and find a way to look into whether this stuff is releasable? I mean, who knows what's on it, or will there's it... There's a hit, I'm told. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing that... They would say that, wouldn't they? Yeah, they're saying there's a hit. I mean, I'm slightly... It has to be slightly questionable, because obviously he did record a record around that time. There was a posthumous album after his murder that came out a couple of years later. And it does seem a bit weird that would Marvin Gaye go, oh, here, here's a mega hit, you can just have that. I'm just going to leave it on a tape and never go back and exploit it. Maybe he thought he could come back at another time and had the idea. So it will be really interesting to hear what's on it and what kind of state it's in. Are they demos? Are they songs that he would have wanted released? This is Sky News, and in just a moment, the press preview a first look at what is on the front pages as they arrive. But first, our top stories. The family of a hostage taken by Hamas has accused the Israeli government of having blood on its hands after his body was recovered from Gaza. Tomorrow marks six months since the attack on the 7th of October. Angela Rayner is facing fresh questions over her tax affairs after old tweets surface where she refers to her husband's house which she's denied was her main residence as home. And the next Irish Prime Minister, Simon Harris, has told Sky News a United Ireland is a legitimate aspiration, but it's not his focus. Hello, you're watching the press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages as they arrive. In the next half hour, we'll see what is making headlines with the executive director of the Youth Endowment Fund, John Yates, and editor-in-chief of nationalworld.com, Nancy Fielder. Thanks both for being with us. Let's see what is on some of those front pages. We'll start with The Observer, which reports on the Royal Navy's role in supplying aid to Gaza. As the Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, warns people trapped in the territory are on the brink of famine. The Sunday Times leads with Lord Cameron saying Britain's support for Israel is not unconditional, raising the pressure on Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu following the killing of seven aid workers last week. The Mail on Sunday claims an investigation by the paper has blown apart Angela Rayner's claims to have not broken any rules over her property dealings. The Sunday Telegraph leads with two former defence ministers warning Britain has failed to prepare itself for war in what the paper says is a wake-up call for the government. Westminster could have been at risk in the sexting scan 
for a, up to a year. That's according to the Sunday People. The Sunday Mirror claims Coronation Street bosses are slashing the number of stars in storylines as ITV looks to save money, meaning cast members fear they could be axed. The Sun on Sunday reports that the home of Newcastle United striker Alexander Isak has been targeted by thieves. And to remind you, by scanning the QR code you see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's papers while you watch along with us. Well, tonight we're joined by John Yates and Nancy Fielder. John and Nancy, thanks both for being with us. I hope you had a lovely Saturday. Let's crack straight on and we're going to get uh, into it with The Observer on the front page. And John, let's start with you on this. This is a David Cameron warning of, warning of famine as the Navy are sending a ship to help bring aid in. I mean, the bad news just keeps coming from uh, Gaza. Um, so we're at a situation now where uh, USAID, the biggest aid provider that the United States government funds, has said that we're facing uh, malnutrition, quote, unprecedented in modern history. And so the story here is that uh, Lord Cameron, Foreign Secretary, is announcing that uh, the Royal Navy is moving to send uh, a, large, uh, a large vessel uh, over to uh, play a part in trying to get aid into Gaza. I mean, we're, we're, we're sitting here just days after uh, the, the, the murder of three British aid mm -hmm. workers um, in what can only be described as a complete tragedy. Um, but it also raises huge questions about what is, seems to be going wrong. Those of us who are very supportive of Israel's right to defence, a lot seems to be going wrong in that war. And I think the British uh, government, quite rightly, are trying to work out how can we get aid in. Mm. The big proposal is can we build a pier off the side of Gaza and bring bring the food in by ship. The Americans have said they're going to do it. I, I, I do worry a little bit that we're getting distracted, though. This period is going to take some time yeah. to build. People are starving right now. The, the Israeli government is clearly in a very fragile state. Uh, the Prime Minister Netanyahu was struggling to run the government before mm. the terrible terrorist attacks happened on October the 7th. And he's struggling to keep his coalition together now. And the war appears not to be leading to much success mm. at present. But we're seeing horrendous loss of life. So I think that the question really is for the government, how can we and the Americans put some pressure on mm. to try and help, in my view, the Israeli government takes some decisions that might be in the long run best interest of Israel, which is to try and find a way to de-escalate the yeah. situation. And uh, that's the big question here. Uh, and actually, they did say towards the end of last week they're going to open Erez crossing in the north and Kerem Shalom, which should allow more aid in. Uh, as yet, those crossings have not still been opened. There are still uh, aid uh, vehicles waiting to get in. But I guess every example of this, of new maritime routes, airdrops, is an example of how there's a failure to get aid in the easiest way by road. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the whole thing is a complete disaster. And the worst thing is, like, like you said, they're, they're saying it could be the worst ever. This is entirely human created and it could be eased. I'm not saying Israel could instantly stop it, but this could be eased and this could be dealt with. These people do not need to be starving to death. And we've got to remember it was absolute tragedy that aid workers lost their lives last week and they were the, obviously the salt of the earth, risked everything to help other people. 30,000 people have died in mm -hmm. Palestine through this war and lots of them were children. Lots of them were completely unconnected to any attack. It was an absolutely evil attack on Israel, but people are dying and it is unnecessary and the pressure needs to be stepped up because it, it's just wrong and it, it's taken a very long time it's taken actually the death of British people, let's be honest, to, for suddenly Britain to look like they're really trying mm. to help. I, th I think what we mustn't lose in any of this story as we talk about it is just the personal horror that's involved. And I think for many of us who have uh, connections or friends or family who are Jewish, we look at this story and we see a horrendous experience that occurred on October the 7th, reminding us of many previous horrors. Mm -hmm. For those of us who are friends and family who are Arab or Palestinian, we see the horrors of the deaths. And I think what we see in the, in the murder of these three aid workers, it's worth just very briefly saying what happened. The, 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 the drone that was being used by the Israelis saw a person, it would appear, with a bag mm -hmm. and thought it was a gun. And as a result, an attack was fired on one uh, a car of completely innocent aid workers, who then, some of whom fled to another car, which was then attacked, who fled to another car that was then attacked. I think the point is not to focus so much on one example, but to say, that is what war is like. Mm. War is full of these horrible, horrible moments of just 
evil barbarity. And it's very difficult to know what Israel could do but to attack and try and get back the hostages. But we have to somehow de-escalate the situation because the worst thing would be if we continue to see this loss of life and we also see a loss of faith and relationship in the state of Israel, mm -hmm. which is ultimately bad for Israel and bad for the Palestinians. Well, this is the point, isn't it, on the front of the Sunday Times. We can turn to that paper now. And this is David Cameron, who's written an op-ed in, in the Times tomorrow talking about British support for Israel. And this is obviously not a headline that you would expect at this stage in a war that Israel was fighting, that support for the nation is not unconditional. And that sort of speaks to the, the stage that we find ourselves at, where uh, the actions of the IDF, in many respects, are losing the support of stalwart allies like the UK and the US. Yeah, I mean, if you remember right at the beginning, after that absolutely horrific attack, it was unconditional and it didn't seem like anybody cared what happened to people in Gaza at all. And now it's six months later and it feels like a long six months to me. So imagine what that's felt like for people living in Gaza if they're still alive, because as we know, so many of them are dead. It has finally, finally started to change. And we need negotiations, don't we? We mm. need people who can put a bit of pressure on. And it does seem like those in power in Israel, the only pressure will be that the they're not ready to negotiate. It doesn't feel like he will ever negotiate. It feels like it will be, we're not supporting you, we're going to withdraw. And whether even that will bring him to the table to make a difference, because it feels like he's trapped in... It feels a little bit like he's a loose cannon. Can he even be persuaded by America? Well, that is the question, isn't it? If they're losing support from allies, whether or not that does change opinions. Yeah. I mean, Benjamin Netanyahu has heard this rhetoric, I'm sure, yeah. in private before this point and hasn't changed tack. It's now public. Is he going to change tack now? I don't think he is going to change tack. I think the question is whether the tack has changed for him. You know, Netanyahu is not the only person who's ever led Israel. He's led Israel for an incredibly long time, mm. but he's probably not the man who's going to lead Israel, I think, for much longer. Ele an election is due. The question is when it comes. I, I think what the US want to happen is an election, and they would like to see a man, Benny Gantz, probably become the leader of Israel. Yep. And it's clear that Gantz, who, who was effectively leading the opposition party to Netanyahu until they formed this war coalition, mm -hmm. um, is saying that he, he's quite up for leading the country and for seeing some sort of change happen. Reporting and I think that's the, the big politics in September, here. actually, that Benny Gantz has, has said that, that he would like to see an election come in September. And we know that before this war began, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu was in a precarious position with absolutely. regular protests on the streets uh, uh, against his rule. Absolutely. And we're, for, for, for President Biden to to have a meeting with Netanyahu and describe it as business-like mm. and then say he is calling for a ceasefire. I mean, this is not quite unprecedented. We need to remember uh, Ronald Reagan, actually, in 1981, said, I'm not going to sell any yeah. arms to Israel until they sort out what's going on in Go the Golan Heights. The US has done this before. It's mm -hmm. put pressure on Israel to say, I think you're actually moving in the wrong direction here. And it's sometimes the way to be a friend to a nation you're friends with is to say some tough things. Yeah. And it's now time to privately and publicly start to say things need to change. And we probably need to see a change of leadership in Israel. Although there's also an American election and that could change everything. It could indeed. Right, let's skip on to uh, the Mail on Sunday now, guys, if you can, on your stack there. And this is the story about the deputy leader of the Labour Party, Angela Rayner. Uh, and the Mail, I mean, being very clear as to how they uh, see the story, the Labour Party and Angela Rayner herself uh, denying that this is the case. But this story continues to have life to it, doesn't it, John? Yeah, it does. It does. And it, I, I feel like it's, gonna, it's got a, quite a while left to run. I mean, it, it, this story fundamentally comes down to, has she paid her taxes? Yeah. And it comes down to a particular tax called capital gains tax. And I think I'd say, if you think you understand capital gains tax, you don't understand capital gains tax. This is a that fiendishly complicated. complicated piece of tax. Now, the mistake that she's probably made probably means she may, she may have underpaid her taxes by £1,000. So just to put this in perspective, if we say that some people during the PPE debacle made about 60 million people, you can work out who I might be uh, referring to, that this is one six thousandth yes. of that amount. Now, a lot of people will say, I don't care about the amount. She's done the wrong thing. I would just say it is quite an easy mistake to make. If she hadn't been married, so her and her then-husband own two houses. Mm -hmm. They got married at that point she has to yep. start paying tax. If she never got married, she never had to pay the tax. Mm -hmm. It really is quite fine details. The, the trouble is, I think there's going to be increasing evidence 
that she didn't declare this house to, as the main residence, which is what she should have done privately to the tax office, if she hasn't done that, the question is, where was she actually living? Yeah. And I think there's going to be increasing little bits of evidence suggesting that she's done this wrong. I, what I wish she'd done, I really like Angela Rayne. I think she's someone who speaks her mind, and I think we need more people like that in politics. I wish six weeks ago she'd said, it's a complicated tax. I may, I may have made a mistake. Yeah. I'm going to get some advice. If I made a mistake, I'll pay it off. I mean, she has maintained all this week that she's done nothing wrong. She's taken independent she's tax advice that she had done nothing wrong, and she maintains that. But uh, as we've said, Nancy, I guess, with the mail, uh, with this splash today, with the photographs they have unearthed, there is still that question, and people will still be asking Angela Rayner, which she doesn't have to do at all, to publish her, her tax affairs to clear all of this up. Yeah, I mean, the, the Mail and the Conservative supporting papers are not going to let this go. No. This is just going to run and run. How she deals with it will be a really interesting question. But I'm not even convinced that this particularly moves it on this story. There were mm. tweets of her saying, I'm home. I get back to Sheffield train station and tweet, I'm home. I don't live on a platform all of the time. <laughs> and I think it, they're just, they are you literally <laughs> chasing this and chasing this because maybe they haven't got anything worse on her. Maybe she didn't go to Eton. Maybe she understands because she once lived in a council house because she had a child very young because she didn't go through all the privileges in life. And maybe that's what we need some leaders who understand real people. I, I think the, Quick thought. the problem is, she, she, if she's proved to have got this wrong and she doesn't pay the tax, it's just going to hang around the Labour Party's neck. It's, and I think when we've got a leader who says it's it, all it, about it, integrity... So if, because she, she says she's taking the advice and she's been advised that she has done nothing wrong, so we'll see how... Absolutely. The next, we uh, certainly will. There's going to be another couple of feet to drop on this one, I think. All right, Nancy John, thanks very much. For that, well, there's plenty more to come, and we'll be talking about this story in the Sunday Times as Harry York has written about being targeted as part of the Westminster honey trap. We'll discuss what he had to say next. I'm Martha Kellner and I'm Sky's US correspondent based here in Los Angeles. It's turning everybody into, you know, a crazy, violent drug addict. How are you feeling? You feel I am angry. It is an anti-woman agenda. Two women say that you paid for their abortions. Are you a hypocrite, sir? Will your candidates win? I hope so. I think they will. I think they're great candidates. I gotta be realistic. My sister's dead. More than four weeks on, there's no murder weapon and no suspect. Are you going to catch this killer? We are doing everything we can. Glenn Maxwell has pleaded not guilty to all six charges against her. Mum, how are you feeling today? Jeffrey said, you answer to Ghislaine, you just don't cross her. I'm so excited. Severe nightmares of these people coming in and just taking me in the middle of the night. I've watched as whole towns were torn apart by natural disaster. I'm alive and I'm thankful for that, but there are a lot of people who aren't. It's not the winds people fear most here, it's the water. We take you to the heart of the stories which shape our world. Do you truly believe what you're saying? A lot of cases that I know are reported from Ukrainian missiles themselves. A ambassador, with respect, I think that's preposterous.
back. There's some breaking news to bring you, uh, and a murder investigation is now underway after a woman was stabbed to death in Bradford city centre this afternoon. Police were called to Westgate at the junction with Druton Road at 3.21 to report that a woman had been stabbed by a man who then fled the scene. The woman was taken to hospital and subsequently died of her injuries. She's yet to be formally identified, but is understood to be 27. We'll bring you more details on that story in the next hour of the programme. Well, you are watching the press preview, and with me are John Yates and Nancy Filder. John, Nancy, thanks for sticking around. Let's uh, get into the second half of the pay-per-view, and we'll start with this story that's uh, on the front of the Sunday People and on the Sunday Times. It's about uh, what they're calling the honey trap of mm -hmm. Westminster and this sexting uh, scandal that uh, has enveloped William Bragg and some other Conservative MPs. Uh, Nancy, it's uh, a reporter for The Times who says that he was also targeted. That's right. So the people's line is that it could have been going on for a year, targeting lots and lots of different people. Um, and the deputy political editor in The Times says he had exactly the same thing happen to him. A message popped up in his phone pretending that it was somebody he'd known in the past, getting a bit flirty, saying they'd been flirty before. And he panicked and he realised he didn't know this person, thought this is probably a scam mm. and did nothing more about it, which you might think the people in charge of leading the country will be sensibly doing all of them. I have absolutely no sympathy for grown adults who are in positions of power who fall for this kind of thing. It's the sort of stuff we warn our children, mm -hmm. quite young children these days, about. And here they go. It's terrible they've been targeted, but it's even worse that they've fallen for it. Yeah. And what do you make of it, John? I mean, it's not just that they're sending sort of messages back. They're sending intimate Photo. body part pictures yeah. as well. Yeah. I think there's a lot to this story, actually. So, first of all, I, I have a lot more sympathy on this than Nancy does. I, I think there's a story here about the psychological pressure that are on people who are members of Parliament. Yeah. Because this is a mad thing to do. But I think we just need to understand how lonely and depressive and full of anxiety your life can be as a member of Parliament these days. And someone getting in touch, forming a connection. Mm -hmm. I, I think that there is something there about what is going on with, with the life around these people that they were drawn into this. The second is, what's going on with the fact that obviously these apps uh, are now things that our children have on mass. So if adults are falling for this, we need to worry much more about our children. Yep. There's a massive movement growing about should children under 16 have social media, which I have colossal sympathy and support for. Okay. Um, but there's the, I think the third thing is here, there's, there's a story um, on the Telegraph about we need much more money spent on the regular armed forces and so on and so forth. Well, actually, part of the reason we don't spend so much on the regular armed forces is because we're worried about cyber. Yep. And this story underlines that. Actually, if someone can get into an MP and have blackmailable material on them, such that they're giving out numbers of other MPs, that's a huge security risk. Yeah. And that's the story we should, probably should be most worried about here. What are we investing to keep our country safe it's not from huge, this sort of... It's not attack. huge cyber defences to stop you texting back on a WhatsApp, is it? This is just basic compliance. Like, if you've got your device, be very careful about who you're messaging back on it. Don't send naked pictures to strangers. It's not it, rocket science. I, I, I agree, but as, as the safety of uh, our security is only as strong as its weakest link. And when it comes to... Um, us being connected digitally, actually the weak link is almost everywhere. So the question is, what's the next backup? So a person gives out a number, they start then passing on information. Who's spotting it? How are we doing? I mean, I, I pray nightly for our security forces at the moment because this is becoming mm. really difficult work. And I think this story just gives us a little glimpse of how vulnerable we could be. We don't know who was behind this. But let's not forget our politicians deleted accidentally, lost all their WhatsApps, they dropped their phones. They're just really bad at technology. Maybe well, we should get some politicians in who kind of understand how the 21st century works. The, the, the fallibility of human nature continues to be the case. And I think we have to, we should worry, firstly, about how do we keep us all safe. I think safe. Nancy's point is that some human beings seem more fallible than others. Uh, maybe, oh, yes. maybe, that, <laughs> maybe that's true. All right, let's have a quick uh, look at the Sunday mirror. Uh, and this is one that would have my, uh, some of my family members quite upset, the Corrie cast of Living Crisis. I haven't read the whole detail, Nancy, but you're telling me that it's all about those streamers again. It is, and this is a bit of a cliffhanger because what they're saying is the storylines will involve less characters because they don't think they can afford them, and some of the main characters may actually be cut, and the actors are worrying for their jobs, which is the worst cliffhanger for anybody because who will die, what terrible things are going to happen at the Rover's return, and 
Actually, it's all the fault of Netflix because they say not as many people are watching, they're not getting as much no. income, and so it's the next. It's always the next generation's fault. These pesky <laughs> people is, who subscribe to other channels. It is. I mean, last thought from you on this. I show. mean, we could have some amazing storylines, couldn't we? Think how many way, creative ways we could kill off hundreds of amazing characters. Massacres. Massacres. Plane crash into oh, it's Emmerdale's plane right. crash. That's what Remember we need that? back again. From, from a while ago. But it will be a shame if uh, some of these beloved soaps are, are lost to the streamers. They've been going for for many, exactly. many years. And as I said, people in my family will be very upset if they are lost. Right, John, Nancy, thanks both very much for that. You're going to stick around for the next hour of the programme. And coming up on Sky News at 11, the family of an Israeli hostage whose body was recovered from Gaza last night so that the country's government has blood on its hands. They've accused the uh, government of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of cowardice for not doing more to have those hostages still held by Hamas and others in Gaza returned to their loved ones. We'll have more on that in the next hour of the programme. Stay with us.